I'd just like to introduce our last speaker for today, Mark Ferguson. Um, Mark is speaking today on making the most of your genetics. Mark is the CEO at NextGen Agri, um, a consulting and innovation company based in Christchurch, New Zealand. He is the host of a Head Shepherd podcast and leads the development of The Hub, the Farm Fit You workshop and the Growing You masterclass. He and the team at Next Gen Agri work with progressive stud and commercial producers across Australia and New Zealand, helping them breed the best sheep and cattle for their situation. Mark grew up on the family farm in Victoria Mallee and has spent his career in the livestock industry working throughout Australia and New Zealand. Mark also has completed a PhD in Merino genetics in Western Australia. Today he will talk to us to, uh, through typical mistakes people make when it comes to genetics in their livestock business and offer selection, uh, suggestions for how to avoid these mistakes. The session will cover both the art and science of implementing a breeding program and how to implement a successful breeding strategy. Thanks very much and thanks for the opportunity to, uh, to be in sunny South Australia. Um, I've been travelling in Oz for just on a month I think today, so um, if I look a bit weary I am. Um, but yeah, it's been great to be back uh, back home. So yeah, I live in Christchurch at the moment and, and we operate both sides and COVID hasn't been great for, for that. But I want to talk today about genetics because that's what I'm passionate about and like to talk about. Um, and I've titled it uh, a little bit of art and a whole lot of science because I think that's what sheep breeding is. Um, I think generally in the past we've probably thought of the opposite, a whole lot of art and a little bit of science. And I think that's the discussion we want to have. We've had great um, intros from from both Nathan and Chad, um, and, and have sort of set me up pretty well to have this discussion. Um, I just want to point out that Bill Walker's going to walk out halfway through my presentation. He's already told me that. Uh, and, and, that's and that's because he's going to the oils. I'd probably do the same to him, so that's fine. Um, um, the, the world is changing, and we've heard a bit about that today, and you'll hear this all the time in the media, but our consumer set is a completely different consumer set than what we've that what we had 20 years ago and it's getting it's changing all the time we're getting way more connected to our consumers both so our food and fiber and our story is 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 in their lounge rooms now and in their kitchens now and that that makes creates all sorts of concerns in our heads but also creates heaps of opportunity and and I always think about this sort of stuff when I'm thinking about genetics because we genetics is slow genetics is a 10-year game you don't get to do you don't get to you can change your vaccine practice and your nutrition practice and have an impact within, within six months or 12 months. In genes, you have to have a plan and you have to actually um, implement that plan because you have, it's, a, it's, a, it's a slow process, as you all know. So we have to be thinking about what our consumers are going to be doing in 10 years because that's what we're breeding for today. The, the rams that you buy this year will still have genetics in your flocks. The bulls you buy will still have genetics in your herds um, in, that, in, in the next 10 years. I reckon there's three mega trends that are converging on the sheep industry and, and they're all relevant to the how we go about breeding animals. Um, Hypertransparency, there's no great, there'd be no great surprise to you that we're being watched more than we've ever been watched before, more than definitely the, the generation before us has been. So we're, what we do on farm matters because a lot of people are watching and a lot of people want to reward that. And if you look at the, the RWS premiums at the moment, so responsible wool sourcing standards, sitting about three bucks at the moment from a, from a non-RWS product. So a massive premium because of this, because they've got people on farm doing audits, producing wool in a way that they, their consumers are happy with. So that's really starting to, to bite. I think carbon's gonna be massive, that's not a, any surprise to you either. Um, climate change, whatever you wanna call it, the fact is that our consumers are gonna be very carbon conscious. So how efficient we are on farm will matter. Because there's only really one place a lot of our brands get to actually try and tweak their carbon as is what they are gonna encourage us to do on farm, I reckon. Like there's not much they can do within manufacturing. They'll be starting to put the pressure back on farms. And the other, uh, I guess, mega trend or trend is, is technology. We're, we're in a place now that's probably best we've ever been in the sheep industry. We're actually starting to catch up with some of our competitive industries, sheep and cattle. Um, we're, starting to, we're starting to see some technology evolve, which is going to make it a lot easier for us to do, to do what we do, um, because there's a, lot of, there's a lot of concern when you start thinking about some of these other things. And so animal welfare starts becoming front and centre in that game, because that's what, that's what matters to our consumers. Um, and I love this quote, that if we care about animal welfare, then we need to also care about animal breeding from a, from a guy in Canada. But 
Um, it's true. We, our genetics has the greatest, and Chad's just talked about it, genetics has a massive impact or has a potential to have a massive impact on how our animals and, are running on our systems because we can breed them to be much less reliant on, um, on chemicals, to be much less reliant on interventions to, and still be healthy, productive and profitable. I like to use this number a bit. I don't know how accurate it is. I just made it up. But um, on average, most of you will get 30 opportunities to make selections on your, on your, far, on your genetics of your farms. So sort of before that, someone older than you is telling you what to do. And, and after that, someone younger than you is again telling you what to do. Um, and so there's about that middle period where you get to make, make decisions on the bulls or, or rams that you're buying and the replacement heifers or, or ewes that you keep. And the point of that number is that it's not very big. There's only 30 opportunities to get this right. Um, and so, so that deserves a bit of respect. Um, you get to change, you get to do lots of things on the farm every day. You get to feed your sheep a fair, fair few times in your careers. But when it goes to actually buying that ram or that bull, 30 times. So you see sort of people rock up about 30 minutes until the hammer starts flying and they're trying to pick out some rams to buy. They're eating a steak sandwich they're, and they're catching up with their mate that they didn't catch up with the footy. And then, the, then they're starting to make some ram selection decisions about somewhere in that, that midst of craziness. Um, I don't reckon that's enough respect for the job that you've got to do on that, on that day because of the power that it can have. That's what 30 years can look like. So that's just weaning weight. Um, and that's, that's what genetic gain can look like over that 30 year period if you do it well. So 2.5% is definitely achievable. You're never going to sleep for one trait. So where it goes to doesn't matter. It's more the difference between the lines. The sheep industry and the beef industry don't get anywhere near 1% on average. We sit somewhere here in our, in our industry genetic gain, which is pretty pathetic. The dairy industry, the individual chicken industries, the pork industry, they all sit out here somewhere. They, they're well above um, sitting at, at sort of scientific optimum. Um, our industry sit, sit somewhere here. So, so there's this big, big opportunity on each of your individual enterprises to be on one of these lines. And there's people in this room that are on one of those lines but there's probably lots of people in the room that aren't on one of those lines. And I, th and I guess this gap is what encourages me to get out of bed every morning is because when I see what genetics can do on farm and we work on, on lots of farms, um, we start closing that gap and we start really increasing. I like Chad talking about how many truckloads of lambs that don't turn up. And that's exactly what happens. When you get the genetics right and you get your management right, there's truckloads extra lambs. There's several bales more wool. I guess the point of this slide is start right now. If you hang around for 10 years and then decide to have a crack, you will never close that, that gap because it's compounding. You get gain on gain. It's like compounding interest. Um, you can notice that those lines widen every year. Um, so sort of hanging around 10 years and thinking about it, sitting on the fence and then going, right, I'm going to have a crack, you'll never catch up to the point that you would have been if you had, have, if you had have actually started back day one. Obviously, you can sell all your sheep, buy someone else's and get up the chain a bit. But if, if we just think about genetic processes, we've got to get on, on, on board and start going as early as we can. Um, one of the things that I see, one of the, I guess, myths in the industry is, is hybrid vigor. It's a, it's a real thing. But I see people using it like it's the only way you can do genes. Like you can only, you just cross something that's unrelated. You get a big lift from those two different animals. And therefore, and you just live on those lifts. And the first golf industry is one of those. But lots of, industry, lots of people are sort of thinking about how they can just maximize this little bit of hybrid vigor, um, and, then, and then that'll do. That's sort of genetics done for them. The maximum hybrid vigor will give you is about 15%. Most of it's less than that. And so on that time scale, if you're doing a 2.5%, you'll, you'll close that gap down in, two, in seven years. So seven years of genetic gain closes down hybrid vigor. Every year after that, you're in front. That doesn't mean you don't do hybrid vigor. You try and buy someone that's doing this. And so if you combine genetic gain, so if you're going to buy a great bottle ester rest of ram from Inverbracky or somewhere like that, Linton, um, um, versus, versus a good, versus a, a great, and you're buying Reno's that you know are from a great source as well, then that, that lift that you'll get it will be doubling up that genetic gain. So don't rely on hybrid vigor as your only practice. You need to be both finding genetic gain or sources of genetic gain, as well as when, if your system allows, using that hybrid vigor to, to take that extra step. So who in the room's making genetic gain? Hands up. Some aren't, or some don't want to, some aren't sure. So there'll be some that are. And I guess the next question is, is how do you know? Because you can tell me you're making genetic gain, and that might be your, your wool's getting wider, or your bulls are getting bigger, or your, 
steers are getting bigger, but but often we just think we're making genetic gain because we're doing stuff. We're selecting rams every year. I go oh, here, I'll keep my young ewes because they should be my best genetics. If you've bought the rams in the same way from the same place that hasn't made any genetic gain in the last 10 years, your young ewes are exactly the same as your old ewes. You actually haven't changed those at all. So I guess I'm not going to ask you to answer these questions. I would if there was a smaller room um, and, we're, and we had time to go through them, but, but I would really encourage you when you walk out of here is to think about, am I making the best genetic gain possible on my farm? Am I, are my next generation of ewes on my farm going to be as good as they can be for, compared to what my last, year, my last year's views were? Because if the answer to that question is no, then, then you've got to start thinking about how am I going to set myself up to make that, that gain that I should be making. And, and what the enemy of genetic gain is error. And error is, is everything that, that we see when we go ram buying and we go selecting ewes. If we walk into a ram ship, we walk into the Classing Classics ram sale that's down here in September 5, was it, Bill? September 9, somewhere there. Um, um, we walk into a, a tent there. We've got, I don't know how many vendors, 40 vendors? 25 vendors, all different nutritional strategies, all different um, farms. They've come together on a single day, and, and we're there, and we're going to try and buy a ram to take home and make genetic gain. There's heaps of error in that decision. We're going to have singles and twins. We're going to have rams born for maidens, more ram born from old ewes. We're going to have rams born early in the season, late in the season. We're going to have different um, porridges they were fed. We're going to have all these different things that are on the day are all there, confusing the crap out of us, making it a really hard decision. Now, often you're not in that mixed multi-vendor sale. You're in your own. You're in a, a, a single place. But often you might be buying rams from a couple of places. And so a lot of the error that, well, a lot of the, a lot of what you're seeing is just, just noise, just white noise. The, ge the genes are what you're trying to get at. And that was Chad's point. If you're not using breeding values to get through that error, and break down and actually make an accurate decision, you really are putting your, so you're, you're farming with your arms tied behind your back. Because all we can see is, is phenotype. This is what we see. It's what we're looking at when we're looking at all those different rams. Um, it's what we see, what we measure, where they got a, what their micron is, what their fleece weight is, what their, what their scan was, their raw scan, all that sort of stuff is just the phenotype. It's made up of genetics, obviously, and environment. But often, we sort of, some parts we think are, are all genetic, um, when really there's heaps of this environmental impact. And that can be all the things that I've already talked about. What they've been fed, how old they are, how old their mum was, whether a single twin or triplet, all that stuff will impact on what we're looking at on that day. And that's both when you're classing a ewes, which we'll cover at the end, as well as, as when you're selecting your rams. And there's just a, three quick graphs. I got told not to, bore, to bombard you with graphs, and so I try not very hard not to, but I'm a scientist at the end of the day, so I'm going to have to have a few. Um, and each of these graphs are the same. This is the breeding value of the sire on this axis. These are all out of a New Zealand Merino project test that we ran for seven or eight years. Um, this is the breeding value of, on this axis, and this is the raw data of those progeny of that progeny group. And so this is fleece weight on this example. Um, and so the first, your first, first bit of information from this graph is that the breeding values work. As the breeding value for fleece weight goes up, the, the fleece weight in their progeny also goes up. Not rocket science, but that's, that's what we do. That's what, for 20 years, we've been seeing this sort of, this sort of stuff happen. But look where, and every one of these, the, each of these dots, sorry, is an individual group of progeny from a sire. Every, on every case, except one, the single-born progeny are cutting more wool than the twin-born progeny. And often that's um, 200 grams, 250 grams, 300 grams. Every time, that's what happens. And that's what's happening. So twin-born progeny have less follicle development in, in utero. They cut less wool for their lifetime. If you've done lifetime um, year management, you would have heard all that stuff. But that's what, when you have a look, if you're looking at a raw breeding, a raw fleece weight on a ram, all this crap's at play. All this stuff is confusing, confusing you. And so I'll run through a couple of different traits um, to just to make that point stronger. So this is wrinkle now. Twin-born progeny are plainer than single-born progeny. So if, we, if you start to say, oh, I want to go non-mules, then you have to be careful that you don't, well, it's nice if you just all select the twins, but you have to be, be aware that, that singles or twins out of maidens can be a full wrinkle score lower just because of their environment, not because of their genetics. Um, so again, wrinkle is, is higher in single-born progeny. Um, and then fibre diameter, the same thing. Twin-born progeny are stronger than single-born progeny because that secondary follicle development means they've got less, um, less follicles, less, and so are, are, are a bit broader. So all those things are playing out when we're looking at a ram, and they're just um, merino examples that I'm using, but it, it plays out across all the traits. 
Um, I think Nathan probably covered this pretty well. We see this, this industry sort of, I think it's getting less, but there used to be an industry argy-bargy about whether breeding values work or they don't, or whether they're good or they're bad. The reality is um, I'm over it. Um, they do work and they work really well. Um, and, and I think as, as Nathan pointed out, you need both the visual inspection and the, and the data to make a really good breeding decision. Um, we don't need this crap in our industry. There's enough, there's enough people having a crack at our industry. We don't need to be fighting within our industry. We need to be to actually working together and, and breeding better sheep. So don't get the, the tools confused with the desired outcome. We often, um, yeah, we want to we want to breed a great sheep, and we want to, and we sort of you're in a camp. In the end of the day, you end up either you're in the breeding value camp, or you're in the soft rolling skin camp, or you're in the um, objective data that doesn't use doesn't use um, either of those things, or you're or you're in a, a completely phenotype only camp. For you as commercial ram buyers and bull buyers, just get really focused on what you want to achieve. Don't worry about the camps. Start using, finding the data that matters. The desired outcome, your desired outcome, is the only thing that really matters. And then you use all the available tools to, to, make, to get that desired outcome. And it might be whatever your sheep type and, and whatever you want to work on is, is completely up to you. And it might be completely different to the neighbours, but you can still use the tools to design your sheep. So the question isn't, whether they work, the question is how you combine those breeding values and how you combine breeding value with, with subjective assessment to, to breed your perfect sheep. This is just an example of where things can go wrong. So this is um, out of the Balmoral MLP project, um, Reno Lifetime product, Productivity Project uh, funded by AWI. These are three-year-old um, three ewes. This was their lamb weaning percentage in that year. And this is their fleece weight to body weight ratio. So uh, that's a 10% is a 60 kilo U cutting 6 kilos, um, whereas a 12% is a 60 kilo U cutting 7.2 kilos. And so, and this, this has been shown in Africa and everywhere, when you go for higher productivity of wool, so higher fleece weight to body weight ratio, reproduction starts falling down. And so that doesn't mean you can't have fleece weight and reproduction and growth, but you have to, have to think about where you, how you're going to design your sheep. Because if you just, if you don't look at, if you just go for fleece weight, then you will start losing, losing lamb weaning percentage. If you just go for lamb weaning percentage, you'll start losing fleece weight. So we have to be, so the beauty of breeding values is that you can start to break these known correlations and you actually build the perfect sheep for you. As long as you know what you're doing and as long as you use them well, um, you can actually design an animal. But if you don't, if you're not conscious of all the things, all the strings that you're playing with, you can have these sort of correlations start playing out and you'll end up having a, an outcome that you weren't actually trying to design for. Um, just, and this is the same data, so I threw this one in there. Um, even on the hard traits, number of lambs weaned, 5% heritable, you think, oh, bugger, that wouldn't even bother. Um, this is the number of lambs weaned breeding value of those size in the MLP project. That's the ewe progeny at three-year-old lamb weaning. Very tightly correlated with, so like Nathan pointed out, you can predict the future. Breeding values are, are very much um, the best prediction tool for, for, the, out, for the potential outcome. So that's a trait that is very hard to shift if, or very lowly heritable, but, but very clearly what, what, what's happening in those, in those sires. I think that's it for the graphs, so hopefully, Jody. But, um, we work from 11 to 44 micron. The principles apply, it doesn't matter what we do. We've got ultra fine flocks sitting down, at, we've got a ram that, that only throws, throws under 12 micron in one of our clients. We've got others that I don't know what a micron of a Hereford is, but um, <laughs> but but we so we work across all these different sheep types across pretty much every well, every sheep growing state in Australia and both islands and uh, both islands in New Zealand, um, and wherever we go, the principles apply. The breeding value principles apply. It's the aim that is very personal to that individual enterprise, um, and the the way, the way you use the tools, the accuracy with you make selection decisions is determines the, the rate of gain that you'll make. It's, it's as simple as that. Clarify your aim, use all the tools you can, and, and you will literally, um, your gain will be absolutely aligned with how well you use the tools. Um, we've covered this already. Most of what we see is not due to genes, all this stuff. There's, in this state, you've got people putting them in sheds. You've got different locations. You've got single twin. You've got different age. You've got different feeding regimes. So there's a lot of things that, that are confusing us when we're, we're making our selection decisions. Um, and it depends on which trait you're after as to how much heritability matters, but heritability is the proportion of 
of the variation you see between individuals that can be explained by genes. So in, in reproduction, 5% heritable, 95% is white noise. So if you're going into a ram sale and you're buying twin-born progeny, the chances are you're buying a, a progeny out of a three-year-old youth who's, who was early born herself and has been pretty fat for her lifetime. Um, if you go in there and buy a higher number of lambs wean breeding value or the new ones in, in litter site, the new breeding values for reproduction, then you know you're going to get what you're, you're, you're asking for. Um, resistant to worms, again, when we're starting to think about our consumers, drenches and drenches are going to be on the nose. 20% um, heritable, so 20% of the variation we see between individuals is genetic. Um, out here at fibre diameter, literally if you're blind you can select for fibre diameter. Um, very highly heritable and we saw in micro madness days that you can shift it really, really quickly if you focus on it. You can ruin everything else in the sheep if you don't do that carefully. But you, we know now that you can select for fibre diameter and, and keep a lot of those other good things or actually make gain a lot of those other good things as well. So big variation in, in the sort of traits that we're playing with. But breeding values um, take all that into account. So when you're looking at a breeding value, you don't actually have to know any of this stuff because you get exactly what, you get half of exactly what it's telling you that, that RAM will do. Um, the key question in all this discussion really is, is what do you want to improve most? Is, because it doesn't matter what, I mean I've got my preferred sheep type and, and it really doesn't matter, I think and I've probably said that three times already, it's, it's what, what do you want to improve most? And that's, the, that's the, the thought process that should be going through your heads hopefully by the end of this discussion is what are the traits that you want to improve most and how am I going to actually do that? Um, I like this, this quote as well, breed a profitable sheep and learn to like what it looks like. Um, not many people will ever do that, I can't even do that, um, but we do need to be wary of types that are in our head, like we've got, they've got to look like this to be productive, they've got to look like this so they can walk to the boar or whatever. Um, do they? Have you ever tested whether they can walk with, if they've got shorter legs can they still get there? Um, there's lots of things we hear in our industry that were, were relevant in the time because we didn't have anything else. We just had, we knew that that sheep got the job done so we're going to select for that sheep type. We need to be careful. Um, the, our sheep types and our sort of our kind of picture in our head of what an animal should look like is actually aligned with profitability, or is it just aligned with what someone else's ideas were about about profitability? Or was it a, was it at a time where we actually couldn't do anything differently? Like open heads, you can't have open heads because they cut no wool. There's heaps of sheep in the industry that have low low head cover breeding values and massive fleece weight breeding values, so you can do both those things. Um, we had all these things in our heads before we had tools, so. What I really encourage people to do is, is work out which traits are for them. And I want you to think about it across four aspects. Because if I asked you which traits you want to improve most, the first thing you're going to tell me is something about making more money. It's going to be either more fleece weight, more weaning weight, more um, lambs on the ground, more lamb survival, which is probably an e is, sits both in, in Save You, uh, Delight a Customer. But often the first thing I hear from people when I ask them about what they want to improve is the making money traits. What I would encourage you to do is think about what are the trades that save you money? What are the jobs that, you actually, that are actually costing you in your business that could be removed or reduced by genetics? Um, I've never actually talked to a farmer that said they've got too much time in their hands, that they're just looking for another hobby because they're really bored. Um, so traits that save you time are really important as well. And um, in our context in New Zealand, um, that's traits like foot rot. No one likes foot rotting sheep. No one likes dagging sheep. They are two traits that are heritable and, you, and about the same level, 20%. We can remove them and reduce them and reduce that, that time factor. So I would encourage you to, and we've got a plan that we go through, but make your money, save your money, save your time and delight a customer are the ways that, that I would think you should think about your breeding plan, not just five traits that, that make you more money because that, that run the, runs the risk of designing an animal that's actually not that good for you or your farm because it just creates more labour. If, you, if they're all just output traits and you're not, not taking care of that animal itself. So, um, yeah, five traits. I'd, we used to say four, I say five now because people used to argue with me about four all the time. But So in a commercial setting, if you focus on five traits that you want to improve, you can, you can achieve that. If you're a Lintonatian, you've got, you've got um, if you're a stud breeder, you're, I expect you to be chasing eight, nine, ten traits because you've got, you've got more data, you've got more information, and you're more fanatical. Um, the, so five traits is what you should focus on and make sure, ideally, they, they come across those, five, those four different pillars of, of make your money, save your money, save your time, or, or delight a customer. Um, 
I just threw a few slides in here on, on one of my pet topics, um, and then I'll get back to the, to the main show. But um, there's a bit of noise around, particularly in the cattle industry, about feed efficiency. And so feed efficiency, by definition, or by the def definition that's used, is animal that does more with less. So you put it in a feedlot, and it'll grow at, it'll either eat the same amount and grow more, or it'll grow the same and eat less. So it's actually converting its feed to meat in a, in a more efficient manner. We have to be really careful about those animals because they are, by definition, not very good at running in, in production systems. They're good in feedlots, but they're not good as, as used to, to run around. What I like to think about is systems efficiency. Use that will run around and by, by storing fat when they've got excess and, and then using that fat when they haven't, actually creating a, an efficient system. And that's much better than, than this feed efficient animal because you're not running a sheep in feedlots, you're running a sheep on on a grass curve that looks like this. Every year you've got drought, every year you've got plenty. Um, you might have fallen under a thunderstorm this year and you've got feed at the moment, or you might not have and you haven't. Um, and so you need a ewe that's going, right, I'm going to put that fat down now because it's not going to be there in three months' time, or, or hopefully in three months it is, but in nine months' time it won't be. Um, and so we need to think about that. So a resilient ewe or a system efficient ewe is one that can handle high stocking rate, um, is handle high welfare and balance per head production. So that's when we talk about selection for positive fat and muscle, that's what we're thinking about. We're thinking about a re resilient animal that is system efficient, not, not efficient on our own, our own basis. And this is what pretty much how it plays out. Um, use that are in higher condition score, use less energy. So if you're, if you're in a half a condition score fatter, you require 0.8 megajoules uh, per day, and that's 12% of her maintenance requirement. So 12% less, grain or loosen or, or whatever you're feeding to, to maintain weight. Um, so those animals, less energy to maintain their weight or they lose less weight on the same, same energy you provide. So breeding animals like this that are naturally in higher condition, which are the ones that are higher fat and muscle, uh, are more efficient in the system. But if you feed them as a young animal in a feedlot, they're not as, they're not as efficient. So We've got to be really careful, because this is what we want. We're designing animals that need less feed on, on your farms or can be run at higher stocking rates. Um, so just quickly, with um, a couple of slides on, on female selection. I don't know what number, shout me out a number. How many, what's your culling rate in your, in your ewes or heifers, in your young, young replacement sheep or cows? Is it somewhere between 25 and 50? Yeah, cool. So we're, all normality applies, that's good. So we've got about between a quarter and a half of our animals, young animals, get kicked out of our farms every year. Um, and we do that with the best information we can, but we have to be really careful because this is one of our sources of error. One source of error is how well you buy your rams. The second source of error is how well you keep your replacement females. Because Chad already pointed it out, the tendency is for you to boot out a twin out of a maiden. That's the, that's the highest likelihood. The next likelihood is to kick out a twin um, because they're the animals that are, that are less likely. In a, in, a, in a cattle sense, that's kicking out a, 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 a calf from a heifer or heifer from a heifer. They're going to be smaller and underdone, but they may be the best genetics. So we have to be trying to think about how we do this job as best we can, and it's not easy um, because unless you've got some data, you can't do much about it. And Chad's point was, was spot on. You have to have recorded who was single-born, twin-born, and out of a maiden or out of a mature-age ewe to actually make any useful decisions. Um, heaps of stuff on this, and I'll go through them really quick. No, I won't actually go through them, but when you're looking at an animal, your eyes are playing tricks on you because you are absolutely prone to selecting an early-born single out of a four- and five-year-old ewe because they are the shiniest ewes in the, in the mob. If we look at the, just the twin effect, and I'll go through it really quickly, but this is Merino Tech data over in WA. We use them a lot because they're not... They, crazy about how much data they, they collect, 60 or 70 traits per animal every year. Um, but if we looked at just what twins do, they're two kilos lighter, they cut, as I pointed out, it's, it's stronger wool, they cut less wool, its staple length is shorter, they have lower luster, lower crimp definition, it looks drier, it's got blockier. There's all these things that when, we, when you're going through a race of ewes or your classer is, all of this stuff adds up that you're just kicking out twins because they just, all those little things make them look a bit less, less nice. So, that's exactly what plays out. The, the MLP project has shown that. They've had all industry classes go through lots of flocks and repeatedly. In those early classing years, 
disproportionate numbers of twins are getting kicked out by those like professional industry classes because of all this stuff, because they don't look as good. But that's not genetic. That's all just environment. That's just the fact that they happen to be a twin, or they happen to be a twin from a maiden. So that's at play every time you colour sheep. This stuff's at play. So the, the answer there is class those animals in their groups. Singles from maidens in a group, twins from maidens in a group, singles from mixed age, twins from mixed age. So if you do that, your brain naturally, when you're classing sheep, I don't know how you go, but my brain just naturally just locks in on culling the, whatever the cull rate is, you just start, and, and, it'll, and it'll change, it'll adjust with which, whichever mob you're in. And so if you do that, you won't have, because if you bring them all together, you've got this big shiny single, and the next one you see is a twin from maiden, and you're looking at it going, that's a crap sheep, just get it rid of it, put a red on it as fast as you can. Whereas if it's in its cohort of group with, with other twins from maidens, then you're going to go, oh, that looks good, that looks good, that one's a bit rough, um, and, and, you'll, and you won't fail from, from that lack of error. The next and best step is to start measuring stuff, and you'll need EID to do that, obviously, but weaning weight, an 8 to 12-month condition score. These are sort of my, I guess, my pick list of things that if you're a merino enterprise and it adjusts with, with other enterprises, um, but weaning weight, condition score at 12 months, because that's really well correlated with fat and muscle, so we get that resilience out of, out of that measurement without spending the four or five bucks to do the, the, the scan. 12-month um, weight, fleece weight and micron um, at some, at that, whichever shearing is, is best, ideally not one with a lamb tip on it still, um, and that first pregnancy and then whether they're wet and dry. And if you get all that information, we can actually start making a pretty handy decision, as long as we know that they were single or twin, or out of a maiden or not, and we can actually start making good decisions about which ewes are staying in our flocks if we're in a, in a merino sense, and similar if you're in a, in a composite maternal or, or other maternal. Um, just some, another data from, from Marina Tech. This is, these, they didn't cull always, always cull their two-year-old ewes, so this is their subsequent lambs after their first lambing. So if they were dry in the first lambing, or didn't lamb at all, they had 2.2 .2 lambs for the rest of their life. If they lambed and lost, so the wet dries, they had 2.8. If they read a single that first, crack, they, they reared three for the rest of their life, and if they reared twins at first, it was 3.2. So those numbers are low because of um, the stud thing, diff different things get removed, but, um, but the trend is obvious. You can, that single, that first maiden lambing is a pretty good indicator of what's going to happen for the rest of their life. So if you only ever do it, if you put a bit of effort in, if you do it as maidens, you can probably then forget about those ewes and just cull the dries or whatever, or cull the ones that um, get crook feet or, or that hold up your dog or whatever you cull them on. Um, and, and you'll go pretty well. I think um, Nathan already pointed this out, but we are just buying bags of jeans. We have to, um, what they look like, you can take a photo of them and put them on your mantelpiece if you like, but the reality is it's just swinging between the legs is the only bit that matters. They're just a mobile delivery system for jeans. And so we have to, we have to think about using those breeding values all as much as we can to make that decision. Obviously, you look at the structure and all the other stuff, um, that's important, and we spend most of our time doing that, ironically. Um, but, but they are just, just a bag of genes, and so you can get them from a, a range of ways. I would encourage you to, to look for more than what you're being shown. Um, stud breeders are awesome at showing you the stuff that they're good at, really, really good at that. I was going through a ram stud site this morning, and there's, there's traits there that aren't even, that you wouldn't ever look like in a, look at in a merino catalogue, and they're there because they actually happen to be quite good at those traits. Um, always ask for, if you've got your five traits, they might not be in the RAM catalogue that you're going to, but if they're using breeding values, there's a good chance they've got them, they just haven't put them in the catalogue because they've only got ten spots to put stuff. If you ring them up two weeks before, you can ask them um, about the traits that are important to you, and they'll, most stud breeders will be really keen because they've spent some after, Sunday afternoon collecting that data and they actually want to give it to somebody. Um, and so you can actually get more information than what might be in your catalogues. I reckon we tend to, in the ram buying part of our business or bull buying part of our business, um, don't use the same logic as we would if we're buying glyphosate or if we're buying drench. So it's okay to compare different ram and bull sites. It's okay to ring up two different people and ask them what they've got on offer this year. You don't have to just stick on, on one place. It's great to be loyal, but you need to buy on merit. Great people can still breed the wrong sheep for you. So just because they're your uncle or your auntie or, or a mate from, mate from footy, they can still be breeding the wrong sheep for you. And so it doesn't make them a bad person, doesn't mean you've got a bad friendship. It just means it's not the place you should be buying your rams or your bulls. So. I would encourage you to have the same level of logic and the same smart 
thinking you have as business people when you're going deciding about where you're going to buy your rams. And I would encourage you to buy on active ingredient, not on brand name. So these are all paracetamol, CHH9NO2. Um, we probably all go into a shop and might buy Penadol because that's what our tried and true, we know, that's, we know what it does. All these other things do exactly the same stuff. Um, and it's the same in your sheep. As long as you've got the type of sheep you're after and you're in the right spot, then you can just buy on breeding values on those, those animals. And the more you make that decision about I'm buying on active ingredient because I know what I want and I'm really determined to get what I want, the less you'll buy Panadol because this stuff might be two bucks cheaper and get, do exactly the same thing for your business. Um, and then f I think finally, um, buy well bred, not well fed. There's your user in paddocks eating grass. I think South Australia is probably the the worst state for feeding up rams. There's some amazing looking ram sheds in this state. Um, be prepared to reward those ram breeders that are actually willing to, to run commercially their rams. There's no point going and buying the biggest, highest fed sheep and then expecting that will be the right sheep for you. It might be if you've got all the right breeding values, but it may well not be. And so be careful that what you see on the day, you're buying bags of jeans and you're buying, and you're buying on, on active ingredient. Um, I would encourage you to have a plan. Um, we've got a plan on our website, I think. I think it's still there. Um, what does 10 years now look from like? What are those five traits? And how? And importantly, what am I going to do to make sure that I'm improving those five traits? And that's it for me. Thank you.